Hello, Mr. Sean Hall. How are you doing, Derek? How are you doing, brother? I am good. Uh, regardless of how the weather is outside, I am actually pretty warm inside. And I want to welcome everyone to the show again. Um, and I'm feeling really happy. It's a long weekend here in Toronto, man. And um, we're good to go. Um, another episode, another, another week. Can't wait to get this show started because I'm feeling really excited having uh, our guests on this show tonight. Uh, I'm sure he's going to have a lot uh, of little nuggets that he can pass on to the uh, to the people who are listening and watching, you know. So uh, before we get started, I know, Sean, you have some stuff that you want to say and uh, some stuff you want to get off your chest. So please, my brother, you want to go ahead and do that. Well, last week I, I came on saying, um, wish my friend Mark Gamble well. But Mark passed away on Monday, Monday morning. And I would like to send condolences now to his family. And um, this is a guy who, who worked with me at the beginning of my career in Canada with, with Laurie Silver. He was my um he was my rock. He was everything to me back in those days. We were both young guys. And you know, he looked after me. He always made sure that when trouble started, Mark Gamble was always at my side, you know, and it's unfortunate to see, you know, he has gone now at this, such a young age. And um I really want to send especially his daughter who, who we know very well you know she's taking it hard but you know time time we have to move on now you know so condolences to my brother mark gamble thank you definitely indeed um uh, r.i.p to mark uh condolences to all his family and people who who, who, who um known him um i didn't know him uh, but you know that's what we do um but he left his legacy behind um, people with good memories. And that's what this is what happens in life, right? We're all left yes. with memories. So um, hopefully uh, some of the stuff that he's done uh, impacted someone and impacted people out there. So, you know. But I tell you something, right? What he's done, what he did in Canada, I don't think it'd be hard for any Barbadian groom to do. I mean, he won 26 races one year with Laurie Silver. And that was his benchmark. I mean, he came, spent three seasons with us, he never came back. Laurie Severa asked him all the time, you know, you got a job for life. But for some reason, he never came back to Canada. But that record and that those days will never be forgotten by a lot of us who who are there. Indeed, my friend, indeed. Um, rest in peace, Mark. Um, as they say, until we meet again, well, for you, Sean, it will be until we meet again, right? <laughs> Never met him. <laughs> um, okay, so on that being said, let's get this show started on a very positive and very bright note. Um, tonight's guest is the one and only uh, Roger Atfield. He's a Hall of Famer, both in Canada and the United States of America. Um, without any more delays, let's welcome Roger to the show mr right. Afio. <laughs> hello good evening how are you doing just wonderfully well thank you great so sorry, great. So sorry about your friend <laughs> yes yes mark yeah, he was with us in 1989 to 1991 when um we first came to canada working with mr silver and he was the go-to guy you know i mean we were young and learned it was amazing how um he was the youngest of the group, but he turned out to be the most successful at the time. My sister Bear just adored him. Anytime he had a nice horse, it always went Mark Gamble's way, you know, and he never let him down. So, sorry, man. Yeah, very sad. Yeah. Sad indeed. Well, uh, speaking of sad, which is not like you, Mr. Roger Atfield, you've <laughs> have a wonderful career so far and um you're down there in hot sunny florida you know when we met with um rocco bowen uh earlier he said it was a little bit chilly is it still a little bit chilly or is it just warm and good it's actually quite hot actually <laughs> uh, 
the day was unusually hot for this time of the year. It, the real feel was 90, 91 degrees and um, been very hot today. And um, yeah, we had a few cold spots, but you know, cold to cold. I mean, we said we start complaining about it being cold when it's 40, 45 degrees or 40 degrees down here, you know. And it does feel cold for sure, you know, but uh, colder than it would if it was 40 degrees up in Canada. But uh, in generally, in general, this year, the uh, winter's been very, um, very good. December was exceptionally good month. So uh, we've been very fortunate compared with everything that's going on north of us, you know. That's beautiful okay. to hear. So, Mr. Uh, Let's get to the meat of the matter here. Your journey. <laughs> this show is about your journey. I can't wait. I'm sorry, Derek, but I really want to find out how Mr. Atfield did this. Because I know you came from England to Canada. How did your journey start from England? Please tell me. Well, I lived in a little village in England, just outside of Newbury, actually, not too far away from Windsor. Um, and um, I, we just lived in a um, little bungalow in the village. My parents, um, um, you know, both worked. And, um, and um, when I was about five years of age, the gypsies used to travel through England, with throughout England, and I think, I believe they still do, but the Roman is, in, you know, the gypsies would come through and go have a, a trip all, all the way around England with their caravans pulled by mm -hmm. their ponies and they'd, they'd have donkeys and goats tied on the back and, mm -hmm. and they used to camp on the village greens for about a week and then move on. Right. Move on. And, um, they happened to be coming up through the village and I saw them going up there and uh, toddled out of the gate and followed them up to the village green and they sort of, you know, looked after me up there and they put me on the donkeys and the goats and <laughs> what have you. And my mother suddenly realized I was missing and she thought the gypsy had stolen me actually. And, uh, but anyway, that's really what started me of loving animals and um, okay. from then on out I always have and uh, so um, I started to ride ponies for local farmers and and what have you and and um, and you know I needed to learn properly what I was doing so mm -hmm. I used to do p paper rounds and milk rounds and catch rabbits and sell the rabbits and what have you to get enough money to go to the local riding school. And, um, mm -hmm. and you know, I was just infatuated with the whole life of being around horses. And, right. and um, so anyway, from there on out, I started to ride at local Jim Carner shows and what have you for the riding school. And, and I was doing quite well. So, a lot of different uh, um, local farmers and and horse dealers and what have you asked me to ride their ponies at these different shows mm -hmm. and and they were selling them out from underneath me quite often when i came out of the ring so from there on out i just carried on and i got better and better and then i finished up riding you know um i rode as an amateur because you know it's very important to be an amateur at that time mm -hmm. Um, an amateur at that time, the, the Olympics was totally an amateur, and okay. um, so it was very important the amateur status. And uh, so anyway, I kept them um, riding and uh, doing quite well. And um, and uh, then when I got to be sixteen or seventeen years of age, um, the um, I started to ride some steeplechase horses and um, actually at that particular point in time I don't know whether you know where um, Parkhouse racing stable is in where Andrew Baldwin trains now his, his father Ian Baldwin trained there before okay. him 
the train mill house and those type of horses. Yes, yes, yes. And, be, and before that, it was Peter Hastings Bass. And Peter Hastings Bass helped me out quite a bit because he said I could use his top gallops on a Sunday, Sunday afternoon, which was a real honor. And um, anyway, I started to ride point to pointers and some steeplechase horses. And, um, and then I was offered an apprenticeship with a, um, a trainer and I went to my parents and said about it and they said, no way whatsoever. Um, you, you're not going to go into racing and, um, you know, you need to get, you know, an education. So I went to agriculture college and graduated out of there. But at the same time, every weekend I was riding somewhere. And, um, and when I finished up coming out of there, um, I hung a shingle up and um, I rented half a farmyard and I made the cart sheds into the stables and I had pigs and sheep and cattle and, and horses and I was riding all over England riding these cheap steeplechase horses and, and still <laughs> still carrying on with my show jumping and and um, everything you know I was doing okay but wasn't making any money which we <laughs> hardly ever do with the horses anyway <laughs> and uh, um, and then um, I finished up, what you really get into is how I came to Canada. Mm -hmm. And um, it was really a, um, it was a um, personal thing, um, um, divorce, you know, everything was in a bit of disarray and I decided I wanted to get out and just move somewhere for a while. Mm -hmm. And I finished up coming to Canada because it was the only place that I, where I knew somebody, and um, I had one friend um, whose family I knew very well in England, um, a, a gentleman called Ian Black, who okay. actually finished up training um, and managing Kinghaven Farms yeah. later on, later on in life, and I finished up getting the private job at Kinghaven. Yes, quite, yes. A bit, quite a bit happened in between there. You know, when I first came over, I came over at that particular point in time, you could emigrate to Canada um, with um, just a, um, a, a, you know, a health certificate and, a, and mm -hmm. a, a letter of unemployment. So you could, you could emigrate in, you know, four or five weeks. And okay. I did, and I got a letter from the show jumping stable in, just outside of Ontario. And that's how I got over, and I started working there. Um, and I knew at that point in time that, you know, I was probably, you know, I knew that I was going to have to work for somebody else, and I had never done that, you know, because yeah, I started but... myself when I was 17. So and, the strange uh, thing about it is, though, the strange thing about it is you didn't really have a race, on, a race horse background in England. And only with the steeplechase horse. Only the steeplechase, but not like turbreds like on the flats and stuff like that. Well, not really, no. I, I used to break quite a few yearlings for flat race mm -hmm. trainers, actually. Um, but I was never really that interested in the flats at all. Wow. You know, I was only interested in the steeplechasing and the show jumping. And um, so that's, you know, like I say, when I came over to... To, to get a job to come over for yeah and um, anyway the, the stable that I was riding for um, the class of, of horses and, and and the shows you know at that time of the year in Canada um, it wasn't what I'd been used to doing you know and the, mm -hmm. the level that I'd been at so um, I finished up um, staying with a friend of mine who managed uh, Frank Stronach's first little farm that he had, which was a farm called Beechwood. And I think it was only about 30 acres or 40 acres, might not have even been that. Uh -huh. And he had, you know, five or six horses in training. And um, I was helping my friend out and Frank came up and said that he was going to the racetrack because his trainer didn't have any help down there and he was short of help anyway. And um, he was going to go down and see if he could straighten it out. So I said, well, I'll come down and give you a hand. And yeah. this was a culture shock to me. <laughs> it, was, <laughs> it was March. 
uh, it was blowing snow. <laughs> uh, I didn't really have the, the right clothes for that kind of weather. Um, and I went down and we drove into Woodbine and Woodbine in March is pretty, pretty it's not nice. It's pretty desolate as you probably know. And uh, so anyway, I went in there with him and I, and I got on his few horses that he had. I was at five or six horses and, and uh, you know, everybody was going out to the training track and it was, it was, it was thawing, but it was, I thought it was really cold. Yeah. Uh, the, the training track was about this deep and um, I thought, well, nobody gallops on that stuff and people were going <laughs> rolling around there, you know, and at that particular point in the time, it was $2 a head to gallop horses and um so i'm seeing all these people and they go jogging onto the track and going around the track and jogging back home and jogging on the track and jogging back home i'm thinking two dollars two dollars what the hell you know, <laughs> it looks it looks pretty good to me um but uh anyway i helped frank out there for a little while and and his trainer a guy called fred lasky and um i went to for the summer, for the summer meet there at Blue Bonnets in Montreal, mm -hmm. and um, it was the last two years actually of Blue Bonnets, and um, the racing there was very, it was bull ringy, um, and it wasn't, it wasn't run really well as far as I was mm -hmm. concerned. Mm -hmm. But um, anyway, I, I was there for the the summer. I came back to Woodbine and. Um, I was really depressed about everything. I mean, the, the racing wasn't anything like I, okay. I'd been used to being around, yeah. and and the, you know, and I wasn't riding the jumpers anymore, and and um, so I thought, well, you know, I could do anything really, you know. Like I mean, when I was riding amateur in England, I had a landscape gardening business, and I had a. Um, boarding kennels and I did a number of things to keep my amateur status and mm -hmm. um, and so I thought well you know if I could more or less put my hand to anything so I put an ad in the paper the next thing I know I'm running a chain of boutiques <laughs> unisex unisex boutiques I set up them from Moncton which is the east end of east, east coast part of Canada yeah. And I got as far as Saskatchewan and uh, Saskatchewan, Saskatoon. And um, so I did that, but every weekend I was riding somewhere. Wherever I was, I had somewhere to ride. Yeah. And um, anyway, I did that for a year. How the hell I did it, I don't really know, but I did it. And, <laughs> um, and I came back and two or three people asked me if I'd go and work for them. Mm -hmm. And... Um, and I finished up going with Roy Kennedy, who um, actually, he he uh, was a big businessman in Canada, had a, had a few horses in Canada, but he was building farms in Ocala. Oh. And um, he built farms and then he'd sell them and go and build another farm and, and he had his horses there and what have you. And he actually was the founder of OBS. Um, mm -hmm which a lot of people don't know, but uh, mm. he was the founder of OBS and took uh, Norm Cassie, which is Mark, Mark Cassie's father, yes, in, not, as, as his main person, and he stayed that way until he died. But yes. um, anyway, I was with Roy um, there, and then in January, I'd moved to, down to Hialeah, and I'd train at Hialeah, and then, then we'd go back to Canada. And I did that for three years. And uh, then um, I decided I really wanted to go public because I was not training. Roy sold all his better horses and I'd have the lesser horses that didn't get sold or didn't even make the sales. So I could, I felt that I couldn't, I couldn't yes. get on that way. Yes. So, I, you know, I asked Roy if it was okay if I went, went public, but I would still continue training for him, of course. Mm -hmm. So that's what we did, and um, and did that for a little while. And so I picked up a few other horses, you know, not very good horses, but horses. And uh, I did that for a while. So, and then um, 
um, Colonel Baker approached me about taking a private job with him. Now, Colonel Baker was the chairman of the Jockey Club of Canada at that time. Um, and uh, that was when it was a jockey club, as opposed mm -hmm. to what it is now. Um, and uh, and I was also offered a private job by another gentleman. But I decided to take the, the job with Colonel Baker. I thought he'd bought a, a really nice yearling that he really felt very highly about, and he wanted a private trainer to train his horses and concentrate on his young horse. And because at that time I was still galloping on my own horses, so um, so I took that job and I brought the horse down to Payson Park in here, where I am now, yeah. um, in 1974. Um, I came to Canada in 1970. And um, so I brought him down here and I brought two other older horses. Baker had like eight horses. And left the other ones up in Canada and brought them down to Payson Park. And this yearling, he named him Norcliffe. Oh. And so Norcliffe, of course, became two after Christmas. Um, we went back to Canada. Um, he was two year old champion for us up there. I was winning a number of state races actually for Colonel Baker with his other horses, or quite quite a few. Um, Before you go, who was your first stakes win in Canada? I'm not really sure. I'm not, no, honestly, I'm not really sure. Um, it was before this, um, uh -huh. it was uh, for Roy Kennedy. Might have been a horse called Cool Wonder. Cool I'm Wonder. not really 100% sure. Um, but anyway, um, you know, Baker and I had, you know, fairly. Um, fairly good rapport and of course I was doing well with Norcliffe so that makes a big difference when you're doing well you always have a pretty good rapport mm -hmm. I found out that in life <laughs> but um, um, he uh, you know and at that time the odd, I claimed the odd horse to, to fill mm -hmm. a void in the stable because yeah. you know, we, only, we only had about 15 horses or so and um, we did quite well out of the claims, and we won a few state races out of the horses I claimed and what happened. Um, and one of them was from one of your good friends, um, um, Laurie Severa, uh, <laughs> Grey Philly, I can't remember her name. But anyway, it's all incidental. But, um, um, you know, that, that relationship with Colonel Baker lasted, um, and I was asked this question the other day, and I can't remember dates at all. Mm -hmm. Um, but I was with him for probably um, five or six years, and uh, and then I went public again because Colonel Baker cut back and he sold his his, his company and what have you, and um, so I went public again, and um, and we did quite well, quite well. We were winning quite a few races with quite a few different people's horses, mm -hmm. and. Um, and then King Haven offered me a private job. And what um, year was that? I know you were going to ask that. <laughs> <laughs> I, just, I just did a little interview yesterday for, and I can't remember the date. I'm trying to get everything. <laughs> this yeah. guy is Sean, eh? He, he just, he's just like quizzing you with the years, you know? He's just like testing your memory. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. <laughs> but, um, geez, I really can't remember the. I mean, no, because I rem I came to Canada in '89, and I mean that's when King Heaven was kicking up with those investment with approval and those type of horses, you know. So I mean, yeah, well, when I just I just obviously with that my natural thing to ask when this march well, but, up. Yeah, but, well, with approval was did you say '89? I think with approval was after he would have been nineteen. Yeah, they, they went back to back. Yeah, with approval in his vest here. Yeah. Yeah. Um, yeah. yeah, well, I trained for them for um, a couple of years before that. Okay. Um, yeah. 
because when I first first took over King Haven, um, we were going to have a couple of slow years, and I, I'd said that when I took them over, and mm -hmm. um, and we did, um, and then um, then with approval came along, um, and like, as, as you say, like Isvestia uh, came along after that, mm -hmm. and, but I mean, there's so many nice horses, yes, and, yes. Um, so many nice horses, and you know we we moved around a lot. And, um, you know, it was nothing for me. To, and I had some really great assistants. You know, I had Mike Keogh. He was yes. just out there. And... Um, he's a great guy, man, Mike. Yeah. And, uh, and he's a trainer now too, right? Yeah, absolutely. yeah. Absolutely. Um, yeah, he's the last one to win the Triple Crown, incidentally. That's right. <laughs> yes. One no, one no. <laughs> yeah, exactly. So is it, is it um, contagious then? Is it contagious wants to hang with you? Great things happen. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. No. So anyway, we we, you know, I mean, it was nothing for us at weekends. At one point of time, there to run at three or four different states and Canada at the same time. You know, like, um, and uh, we won a lot of races, and um, I, can't, I can't remember which what year it was, but I won 31 state races the one year. Oh. And, um, you know, it's, we had a tremendous run, tremendous yes, yes, run. Yes. And, um, and then, you know, to the, to the degree of, um, market control, it was a $40,000 claim and won the Queen's mm -hmm. plate too, you know, so it wasn't all the superstar horses, yes, we yes. Jumped yeah. out of it. but, um, anyway, after, after, um, King Haven, you know, cut back and then, you know, sort of basically closed down. Um, but before that, actually, I was still training for them, but I was public as well. And um, mm -hmm. and that's when um, when I inherited, inherited a two-year-old, I said uh, I said I wasn't going to take any more horses. I had mm -hmm. too many horses, and I finished up taking a phone call one night and... and um, you know, and I said, okay, I'll take him, I'll take him next week, and we're just about to go down to Florida, and we'll take him down there and see what we can do. And his name was Peasky, so. <laughs> 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 but, um, yeah, so, and, you know, like. Did tell me you almost refused Peasky? <laughs> yeah, I did almost yeah. refuse him. I promised I wouldn't take another horse. <laughs> But uh, so you never know, and that's what keeps you going. I mean, yes, it yes. does keep you going. And um, and then, you know, I went through a period of time where where I was public and um, I had divisions. Well, I in my time, I've had divisions in San Anita for the winter, Aqueduct for the winter. I was in New Orleans for quite a, quite a while, Monmouth for quite a while, Delaware, Maryland. Um, I had divisions in these different yes, places yes. in California, Arlington Park. God wow. bless Arlington Park. That was just such a beautiful racetrack, ran yes. by a beautiful man that knew exactly how to run racing. It's very mm -hmm. sad what's happened there. Um, mm -hmm. But at that time, I was so conscientious. I had a motor home and a driver, and I drive from one track to the other through the night. And I was there the next morning at another track to work and mm -hmm. go to the races, have dinner with an owner, have been to motor home. You know, another track the next morning, I'd be yes. at five o'clock. And I did that for a few years. But, you know, that gets very old. And today, yes. it would be impossible with the border mm -hmm. the way it is. It would just, you'll be doing COVID tests every five minutes. You know? <laughs> you know? And that's not pleasant. Yeah. Yeah. So getting better, you know, <laughs> but still not pleasant. Unless we're unless we're getting used to the uh to the testing and it, it makes it a lot easier for us to travel. But what I, I don't know. I I'm not willing to do all those testing like what people put up with. <laughs> so I'm staying right here in Toronto. <laughs> Yeah, I know it's it's got to be ridiculous. One thing I got to ask you, I'm you know as a horse trainer to another horse trainer, what is your secret for looking for a a, a good horse, a good race horse? Because Laurie Silver, I know he he had this, they had to have that quarter horse look, you know, that big nice shoulder, nice 
kind hand and nice and not clear the nostril and we always said have to have a kind eye you know what was what's your secret because you've won eight queen's plates you know yep but i mean yeah but i didn't i didn't uh i didn't buy those horses either you know okay I, I so you, you inherited some but um, i have bought some nice horses myself and gone on and did have done well and you know but uh yeah i mean i personally yeah confirmation wise you're talking yeah uh, yeah i mean to me the eyes are quite quite important you know they're, mm -hmm. the, the demeanor that you know just look at you know i look at them for quite a while but uh, I love, you know, I like a, a really nice shoulder. Mm -hmm. I love a, a very deep girth. I mean, mm -hmm. I want to see a good deep girth on a yes. horse. And then, you know, a big hip and a lot of the distance between the hip and the hock. Um, mm -hmm. And um, basically just the way the horse walks, you know. Mm -hmm. but, uh, he has yeah. to walk like an athlete. Yeah. You know. well, since we're talking and about then, that, an athlete, sorry. Um, because I like to get the uh, the viewers like to participate in the uh, conversation as well. Mm -hmm. And there's someone asking, Roger, um, about the Philly Av. They want they want you to talk about Av. I'm not sure what they're talking about, but you can maybe you can let us know a little bit about Av. Yeah, well, we called her Ave, but yeah, A V E. Yeah. Ave. Yeah, but it, I mean, I don't know. Uh, she was a filly i did very well for the syndicate there was a syndicate um in in um, kentucky um that were bred by these european fillies um and um and see if they could improve prove the you know the horses fillies with some you know reasonably good pedigrees mm -hmm. that hadn't been really doing very well over there and they would buy them and they'd send them to me and Ave was one of those fillies mm -hmm. um and she turned out um she turned out to be very, very successful for them uh, well and for me but uh mm -hmm. she um she'd won one race um and run a few times sort of mediocrely and um anyway i went i i um and make sure I got the right filly here. Um, I won a number of stakes with her. Yeah, I won the Flower Bowl with her in New York, the, the Group One uh, Flower Bowl. Um, and then we went to Japan for the big race in Japan, um, which didn't work out quite so well. We had a really bad trip, but she got sold to Japan um, for a lot of money. Wow. Yeah. Yeah. that's not so bad also right <laughs> no i've done that actually for that particular syndicate i had miss keller miss keller was you know i won group one with her she got sold for you know a few million and um and i think she went to japan also but um i had a few fillies for those people um there was another filly um oh I don't think of their names now. Um, so, so besides besides winning, is is that big? Is that a big part of the game also? Like having the horses being sold. Like we heard the story of uh, like mind, mind that bird, when that horse was was uh, was sold um, from um, over here, and uh, somebody picked them up and just won the Kentucky Derby. So is that also a big part of a part of the game? Well, I mean, if you can do that, that's, yeah, I mean, that was a Cinderella story right there. But you're mm -hmm. talking yeah. about. Um, um, but, it, you know, with fillies, with pedigree, you know, mm -hmm. it can be very, very lucrative, you know. Yes. Um, had a filly uh, two years ago, I guess two years ago now, Elizabeth Alexander, Elizabeth Way. Mm -hmm. um, yeah. And uh, she was bought um, and... You know, they asked, they said, you know, if you could win an A other than with her, it would be great. And I won stakes with her and what have you. And she got sold to, I think she went to Japan too. She was in, they bred her to American Pharaoh and, and, and she went over there. But, uh, um, but, you know, those kind of fillies with, 
you know, she was by Frank or out of a group one winning, mm -hmm. winning mayor and they bought her from Godolphin. She'd won five times for them and not done very well. Mm -hmm. And um, and I won an A other than with her and then I won the stake with her down to Ferry One or whatever it was in, in Gulfstream here. And um, she went on and then got retired, put him forward to American Pharaoh and she got sold to, to a, she went abroad also for, you know, quite, quite a bit of money. So, yeah, it's very nice if you can do that. Yeah. yeah. I mean, that, I mean, if you can, if you can make the money like that too, some people would say that's pretty awesome. But you know, there's some people who chase nice, yeah. championships. Mm -hmm. Is there a title or a, a, um, I don't know a, a greatest stakes that you would love to win? You have on your radar, on your bucket list. Is there anyone? Well, I mean, you know, obviously it'd be the Kentucky Derby. You mm -hmm. know, if, if one just if one. God knows how many stake races in the states, and and um, um, you know, I, <clears throat> my situation with my stable and my my sort of owner base and what have you, um, you know, I don't have much opportunity to have a horse in the Kentucky Derby in the first place. Mm -hmm. um, but I have, you know, I went there with Talking Man. You know, he, he was. He was second favorite, I think, in the race at the time, but um, mm -hmm. that was as close as I got. And he and he went wrong in the, in the Derby, and and um, you know, so that I don't know where he finished. In fact, actually, I think he was fifth or sixth or something. But um, but you know, he he won the Gotham by many. He won the Wood, and then he went to to the Derby. You know, like um, you know, he was one of the favorite horses. Um, and it didn't work out, but that was, just, you know, one of the closest ways I could get there, you know. And um, so, yeah, that would obviously be, that would be the creme de la creme if that, you know, if that could possibly happen. But it'd be a big I, dream. I always find it amazing that, like, for you guys, like, you guys handle so many horses, but yet you have a memory when we talk about a horse in particular. You can talk about this horse. Just like that, on the dime. Like, how do you do that? Like, what what keeps you, you know, going like that? What 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 brings you to that moment of that horse? Like, we talked about Ave. You talk about Talking Man. Like, how does that happen? Is it just the drive? What is it? Yeah. Well, I mean, the bottom line is, um, to me. You know, I want to be close to my horses. You know, like I mean, I don't want 150 horses. You know, that I want to see all my horses every day, which I do. And um, and uh, so, consequently, the, the you know, the, you remember most of them actually, but the better ones, you remember everything. Um, <laughs> you know, every little thing that that happened to them on the way and, you know, coming up for certain races that you never made because something happened. Um, and, uh, you know, lots of silly little things. And then, you know, people say to me about triple crowns, um, you know, how difficult is it to win a triple crown? Well, mm -hmm. firstly, you have to have the animal in the first place, but mm -hmm. you have to be able to manage that animal that from the one race to the next race to the next race. Right. Correct. So you bring them to the, their, their peak performance for each one of those races. Mm -hmm. And you mm -hmm. can't do that by keeping them at the, you know, the high peak all the time. Yeah. Yeah. It's, you know, it's not going to happen. So, yes. um, so therefore you, you're very careful about your training regime and you know, how they're handling this and the other. When people say, do you ever get nervous about you know, and I said, yeah, I get nervous when somebody leaves the wheelbarrow on the corner of that barn right there, you know, that you might just go around and kick and kick that yep. wheelbarrow and it's yep. gone. It's, yep. it, it's gone now, you know, and they're all things that maybe you've got some control over. You have no control over whether they get the cough or cold, you know. Yeah. <laughs> and um, so, but you remember all those little, little things that happen, you know. In fact, I can tell you a story about with approval at, at when at that particular time when he was a two year old, 
I kept my kindergarten, as I called it, down at, because King Haven was quite a large stable. We kept the kindergarten down at Fort Erie. And I'd go down there every Tuesday and I'd work those horses and what have you. And sometimes I'd go down, you know, on the Thursday or so. But, um, and, you know, we'd, we'd, we'd work these horses and then after they got to the particular point of time where they were about two or three works away from running, I'd move them up to Toronto. And uh, with approval was showing, or, you know, I, I, I knew that he didn't like the dirt, but I knew that he was a really good horse and he could win on it. <laughs> and um, he was close to making his first start and he got loose on the track and he ran back up the road and he swerved and he ran into the barn and he had his shoulder on the wall and he was three months getting over that, you know. And so basically the bottom line is he didn't actually start his two-year-old year to you know, quite late, yes, but yes. Um, but all those things you remember those because you you know and you're, you're saying to yourself, lying in bed at night, saying, "Damn it, I hope that horse is going to be okay because I know he's a good horse." And you know, this was it's nobody's fault. I mean, it wasn't any fault that the rider mm -hmm. fell off the horse yes. and he did some some moves that most riders would come off, and they, you can't blame your rider, um, but. Something like that could be the end of it all, right? You know, before it even starts. So you remember all those things, and you remember the sprint that came up two days before a big race. And, you know. I want to jump in here and ask another question that one of the uh, the viewers is asking, and they want you to talk a little bit more about Palladio and Hid Quirks. Oh, does that ring a bell? <laughs> yeah, well. Palladio, um, he was a big, big, strong uh, horse with an attitude, and uh, <laughs> he, he did have an attitude. And um, but he wasn't a bad horse at all. You just had to understand him, and you had to, you know, um, you, you had to understand him, and then he was, he was fine. But he had a big quirk about the gate, and um, and. Uh, Actually, you are talking about Richard Das Ramos earlier on. Mm -hmm. uh, Richard helped me with this horse a lot because mm -hmm. um, we were having a big problem with him at the gate and they, they tried to get too strong with him at the gate. And I said, you can't get strong with this horse. Mm -hmm. If you try, try to get strong with this horse, he will beat you and yeah. he'll beat you really well. And, and you won't win. So. He was like that about everything. And um, so at the gate, you know, he got that he was a real problem and they tried to sort of get strong with him. And that was not a good move because he just retaliated more then. And um, they tried blindfolding him and he ran into the gate and hit his head on the gate and made him have a nosebleed and everything. And that pissed him off more than anything, probably. But um, anyway, um, I had the feeling that if everybody just left this horse alone, he would be okay. So I said to Richard one morning, they, they'd done the training, they'd harrowed a training track. The boys from the gate were in the kitchen um, and the tractors had to go all the way around before they went off. So I took the rail down in front of my barn because I was not there's only about, you know, Three sixteenths of a mile from the gate, and I said to Richard, "Be on the horse, be on the shed rope." Well, I take that rail down. We're going straight down to that gate right now, before anybody gets there, and I want to see you ride that horse into the gate on your own, just mm -hmm. on your own. And uh, so we went down there, and he rode the horse up and stood in front of the gate, and you could see him thinking, you know, like I'm going to be a bad son bitch, and well, we're not going to mess with you, you know, like get in. He walked in the flipping gate. Wow. <laughs> I shut the back gate and he's standing there fine. I said, well, I opened it up, backed him out. I said, okay, Richard, turn him around once, ride him back in. Turn him around, rode him back in. Perfect. Gate rooted <laughs> up. <laughs> they gave he had a mind of his own. He, nobody was telling doing? him what to do. <laughs> I said, well, listen, watch, just watch, lads. 
believe me, please just watch. Yeah. It'd be okay if we do this and don't yeah. have anybody in the gate handling him. Mm -hmm. You know, you can have somebody in the gate, but if you want, but I'd rather you didn't have anybody near him. Don't touch his head, don't do anything with him, just leave him. And that's that was the answer to the gate. But of course, consequently, when we went out of town with the horse, you know, I'd spend a lot of time with the gate crew and the starter, and I'd say, you know, um, excuse me, I'm not trying to tell you a job, which I'm not, um, but I do know my horse. And um, I'd rather, you know, no lead up, no handle, and uh, he'll be fine. And, and he was. And, uh, but anybody tried to rough him up, I mean, he would, I mean, he'd just be antagonist. He really was. And in fact, actually, that particular horse, um, he, we had him down here, and um, they had the, um, the Stronach group had the, um, the Florida bred deal going on between California and Toronto, and they, they, they if you remember rightly, they swapped over each other each year they went either to one place or to the other place mm -hmm. and um, he would have been the favorite for the big race because you got a flight of california yes. so semi my fault because i didn't go down to the airport to load him i sent a guy down there with him and i said make sure that everybody knows just to leave him you know leave him alone don't leave start him alone. Gotcha. Him. right <laughs> well he got on. He didn't want to get on the plane, plane in the first place. But then he would, he would, and he did. But he got on the plane, and then he, you know, didn't want to back up properly. So he started to shank on him and everything, and he took that plane apart. And so they took him off, and they said he can't go. So we never got to go. That, that that was his that was his attitude. So that's probably what they're talking about. I get the feeling that the person that asked this question knows some insight <laughs> about <laughs> Palladio. <laughs> it's a good possibility. <laughs> no, no. What are you drinking there? What's in that in that little glass? Is that some um, some tea? Some iced tea? No, no, no. It's too late for tea. That's a, a very nice red wine. Oh well, that's <laughs> yeah. That's good. That's, that's yeah. to get you to sleep, man. <laughs> it's not even it's not, not Barbadian rum or anything. <laughs> Wait, don't tell me. Did John try to break you into a tamonge? <laughs> uh, yeah, yeah. I've got a number of good bottles of rum from Barbados still in my bag. Yeah, I, I'm, I know. I know. John Jones is a monge guy, a monge rum. Yeah, he is. <laughs> well, he was. Naturally, seeing pictures of him, if you're listening, John, oh, you, it, it puts some weight on him, you know? <laughs> <laughs> Sounds like you guys had a lot of fun together. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, yeah actually, about you stuff. know, you're talking about John, oh, and you're talking about horses, yeah. and you're talking about different characters and understanding your horse and this, that, and the other. <clears throat> John oh, worked very, very, very hard and very closely to me with um, not bourbon to win the queen's yes. play between if, if jono hadn't been helping me out with that horse i wouldn't have won the plate with that horse wow um and at that particular point of time i had a broken foot and um i was and um i wasn't supposed to actually be out of the house but i would come down in my truck and i'd park up on the top bank of the, and uh, I'd talk to jono and we you know, I had a set way to train this horse and had start him off early in all his gallops and finish in a certain fraction. And, you mm -hmm. know, and I was very, very particular about it. And John would say, well, what do you think? And I said, well, you didn't go, you didn't go slow enough early and then you didn't go fast enough late and da da da. But um, and then he said, look at my arms. He said, I can't hardly hold him. I said, oh. <laughs> but he did a great job with that horse and, um, mm -hmm. And uh, if it hadn't been for John, I wouldn't have won the play with that horse. That's great cool. news, man. Yeah. But I'm, I'm, I'm heard now you have a lot of Barbadians working for you right now, or you know, recently. What do you think about our horsemen from Barbados? Well, if they're all listening, I'd 
<laughs> no. <laughs> Uh, no, I'm they're, holding they're, back. <laughs> <laughs> they're great guys. They're, gonna, they're some great guys, and uh, you know we got a good team going. And um, yeah, I love them all. To them. Actually, uh, Roger and Sean, the person who I, I can't see the names of some of these people who are commenting and and stuff like that, but the person mm -hmm. who asked about Palladio said uh, that they wrote they wrote him. So, um, but I can't oh. see the name. So, so I, I, I don't know who Ted, it is. Ted, Ted Holder. Oh, okay. I, I don't know who it is. I can't see a Ted name. Flynn. Oh, you mean Gallup him, not Rodin. Yeah, he's a Gallup him. Yeah, yeah. Oh, probably, maybe. I don't know. Yeah. 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 I got with Ted, man. <laughs> okay. There you go. Uh, you know what? I'm going to ask you a question here. Um, because I mean, like you're a multiple like uh stake winner. You've you've got so many wins. You got almost. Either you, are you past two thousand yet, or just no, underneath two thousand? Yes, under. Tell me, I need five or something like that. Yes. Yeah, something like that. And How I, I'm just wondering, it? how are you going to celebrate it, man? With some <laughs> wine? I don't know. <laughs> I'm probably still be drinking this. <laughs> That's a good idea. <laughs> but I wanted to ask you this. Um, so, I mean, you've 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 got eight. Um, Queen's plate wins. You've got so many stakes win. Uh, you're so accomplished. Um, who do you listen to in the morning? Like, where do you, like, when someone says where to put the horse, who do you take your advice from? Is it from naturally you or just someone else you lean to? No, it would be me. Yeah, I mean, you know, I have to, you know, I had to make the decisions and rightly or wrongly, but um, you know, like um, if you, you know, you're training any animal really, um, you've got to be able to understand the animal and you've got to be able to see different traits in that animal and what have you. Now, you'll have, you know, people that work for you that you that you trust their ability and their and their knowledge and ask them also you know what what do you think you know you know what you think but mm -hmm. what do you think you know and um and uh i mean it's it's a team effort anyway the yes. whole thing is yeah. a team effort if you don't if you don't have a good team you know everybody's got to be on side right yeah and and it's difficult when things are bad you know when mm. things are good it's really easy yeah yeah right but, when things are bad, excuse me. When things are bad, that's that's when the real um, real truth comes out, and people, when the true grit comes out, right? You know, like uh, we got to fight to get this right, and you know, sometimes it takes a while because a lot of a lot of times when you're you know on a on a bad bad role. Um, you can't do anything about it. And I've always said to all my ex assistants and that that a number of them have gone on and done very well, actually. I'm very proud of that, too. A yes. number of my assistants have gone on and done well. And, uh, but I've always said to them, you know, like when things are really bad, don't change anything, you know, mm -hmm. because it's easy to start second guessing yourself and say, yeah. well, maybe, maybe. Mm -hmm. hello, it's worth the years. It's worked for years, yeah. you know, you just stay the same way, stay down to detail because training, training a horse is all about detail as far as I'm concerned, you know, I mean, the main thing that you have to do is keep your horse healthy and happy. You got a horse has got to be happy. I don't care. I don't care whether it's a horse or a dog or, or mm -hmm. whatever. You've got to be happy. If you're a kid in school and you have a teacher that you don't like a little bit, and he probably doesn't like you too much either. <laughs> you don't, but you don't learn from that teacher. Yeah, you never sure. learn from that teacher. But you learn from somebody that you're having fun and enjoying it, and you're happy. You learn, and um, and, and and animals exactly the same way, in my opinion. So that is the main key: is you know keep them healthy and happy, and and then they you usually get the best out of them, whether whatever that level is and they can't all be good horses right but that's right some place in life you know that's right 
So I, I learned that very early coming to Canada. Um, horses need, I remember we had one horse that was an $8,000 claimer. And I remember Marlon Johnson, she took over that horse and took that horse from the 8,000 rate up to 40,000 just by giving this horse carrots every day and apples and kissing him up and all kind of, and some horses just respond to that kindness, that love. You know, some guys get a little rough with them, especially when they're cheap, you know what I mean? Uh, you piece of this and that. Yeah. So, yeah, it's very true, man. It's not going to improve him, roughing him out if he's cheap, right? I yeah. mean, you're only cheap. What's cheap? Cheap because you, 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 you're slower than the other horses, but it yes. doesn't make you cheapest in life, really. You know, like, I mean, I mean, my opinion, and it was taught by my father this, that, you know, you, you did everything to your very, very best. Mm-hmm. And if it wasn't good enough, that's fine, but you, you shouldn't be able to look back and say, I didn't do that properly. You know you did it properly. You're just not that good at that particular mm. point. at that point. You know, at, at whatever it is, whether it's athletic or whether it's anything. You know, like I mean, you've got to be able to say to yourself, "I did that the very, very best I could possibly do," and then you're happy with yourself, mm-hmm. and then you know where you sit in that situation, right? So, you know. so I'm going to ask you so. I mean, since he's talking about Sean, Sean brought it up, he, he's talking about the cheap horses. When you get a cheap horse, or well, say, I won't say when you get a cheap horse, but when you get a horse that is not to the caliber that you would like it to be, do you naturally um, get rid of it, or, or you work with it and try to make it better? Well, I mean, you have an owner situation here too. Um, the uh, Forgot about that. I mean, <laughs> but you can't forget about that because, you know, it's, it's so easy. You, you, you go and spend X number of dollars on a horse and, you know, it's easy to say, well, that horse can't be a $25,000 horse because I paid 250000 for it. Yeah. Well, yeah. yes, it can. And, um, and you've got to come down to realization and um like i say if you treat every horse the same way eventually you'll come to a point in a time where you say this horse fits this level you run him up here he's going to keep getting beat you keep doing that enough he won't win at that level <laughs> where what he should have done in the first place he'd be cheaper because now you've taken all the heart out on him you know mm. it's nothing worse than you know, like ourselves. I mean, there's nothing worse than going out and, and trying to do something and you know that you've done as, as, as good as you possibly can do, but you can't, you can't do it. You know I mean? You, you can't do it the way it's supposed to be done. There's no such word as can't, in my opinion, but you know what I'm saying. Yeah, exactly. And if you keep driving on, it's just like a kid at school. You're running, you know, I used to be reasonably good cross-country runner. I couldn't sprint with a damn. Well, you keep sprinting me against these guys that are going to keep beating me up. Yeah. Eventually, I'm not even going to try. Yeah, yeah. Right? You know, you know, you, you can't do it. Yeah. And um, so it, it, the horse is the same way. If you can't eventually recognize what the horse's true value is, then you're going to ruin that. You're going to, you're going to take the, all everything out of that horse in the first place, and and you're going to achieve nothing financially for yourself or anything because you're running them in the wrong place, you know. And now you're taking all the out of the horse, and now the horse wouldn't win for five thousand dollars somewhere, you know. That's not the horse's fault, you know. Now I've always admired the way that you um, that you train your horses because I see when you put horses in races. Even if the horse you run fourth or fifth or something like that, I know the next time it will come back probably stronger and, and better. So for me, I always look at your horses as horses that will improve after a few races. Is that the same way you train as well, or do you look for the win right out of the gate? 
Well, you're probably talking about young horses there. Um, you know, um, I never, I never really wind a young horse up to win first time out. Um, you know, if he's if he if he has the ability to do it, he's going to do it. Yeah, you know for sure he's going to go over there fit and well enough to be in a race. But he yeah. won't possibly probably be mentally really in tune to going out and blasting away there in a, you know in a cheap in a early two year old race going short. Um, so that's where you may be seen where they improve after a couple of races. Um, but um, yeah, I mean that's just uh, just my style because I'm trying to make the horse eventually as good as he can be. You know, like you can burn them out pretty quickly early. You know, so all the good horses you have trained, which stands out to you that you, you know, I mean you you don't forget. Sorry. That all the good horses you have trained, which is the most stand out one? Which ones you you really love? Um, do you want eight Queen's plates, especially? Is there any favorites that you really, really enjoyed that horse training it? Well, I've I've always said that the most talented of all of them was is Vestia. Um, Vestia, mm. yeah. I mean, mm. you know, from from day one with his Vestia, I didn't think he'd get beat. You know, well, and. Uh, um, with approval was, you know, a great horse and probably won't, you know, would go down as being the better horse. Um, I, he wasn't going to be the same kind of horse that could go. In. I knew he, could, he didn't like to do it in the first place. I mean, mm -hmm. I knew going in that I could win the triple crown with, with approval if I could get through the first two stages, which were both on the dirt. And I got very lucky, in fact, in the plate because it was literally a bob. He could have gone either way. I didn't know myself. I had no idea um, oh. that close. And um, if that bob had gone the wrong way, it wouldn't have would yes. been no triple crane. So, it was, you know, um, <clears throat> but his best year, I never went into any one of those races. Well, lying a little bit because he, he had very shelly feet. And we had a big problem getting shoes on him. And actually, he ran in the Prince of Wales with only two two nails in one shoe. Wow! And it was and serious. It was, only, it was only myself and my my closest in the barn and the blacksmith that knew that. I never told wow. you this because they, they these are the nothing. things that no one ever <laughs> know <laughs> about. No, that's shocking. <laughs> and because they didn't have they, they didn't have the technology of the stick on show, shoes now that. that yes. They do now, you know, they weren't reliable. Um, but that apart, I, you know, I wasn't really that concerned about it because I think he could pull all four shoes off and he would beat them anyway. You know, that's how confident <laughs> I was in that horse. You know, and I mean, he won the triple crown at a total of 31 ranks or something, but didn't he? How bad did it hurt you then from when he got hurt then? That was a really, that was, was the, the uh, biggest, I don't know, I'm sorry to bring it up. Biggest heart heartbreak of my whole life. Uh -huh. That was definitely. I mean, he he was syndicated. He was going to stand in his father's store. Um, he he uh, it was he was as sound as a bell of brass. You know, like I mean, it it, it was devastating to me. And and in fact, actually, he wasn't we he wasn't going to run in the race. And um, um, you know the. King Haven had done their deals with the horse and, you know, he's going to start and, and um, I was the instigator really of saying, you know, like, well, why wouldn't we run him one more time? He'll win this race, you know, and uh, there's no reason <coughs> why we shouldn't run him. And I actually had gone home the night before and I put two sheets of paper down on my desk, and one why I shouldn't run and one why I should run. And this page was and this one they had pretty nothing on it you know and uh and so yeah it was devastating it was devastating and uh and he'd only gone half a mile he was still in a gallop you know they mm -hmm. still had another whole mile to go you know yes, yes it was it was something that you can't explain i mean you know he was so sound and so well and uh yeah i mean those things break your heart 
So wow. obviously it was just and a bad it, step then, eh? But it broke the heart of all my people. Mm -hmm. And um, uh, very, very tough. I, I mean, the next day I knew I had to go to work and try to hold this whole thing together. And mm -hmm. It was very tough. I think that hurts a lot of people in Canada in races, period. Because, I mean, I remember how I felt when I saw it. It, it, mm. and I wasn't working for you or, or anything to do with you, but it hurt me just watching that. Yeah, so, yeah. Those things are, yeah. Not good. Thanks for bringing it up, Sean. I mean, I'm, I'm a horse trainer and I know when, when you lose a horse, Especially when you know that the song, it, it, it is a bad taste in your mouth, man. You know, and you always dealt with yourself, but I wonder if I did you know what, where, when, how come, you know, and well, like this horse, of, he, he was a great become horse. Of, they become, become part of your family in the, the yeah, big, time, yeah. big part of your life. So, you know, yeah. Very much so. Now, speaking of horses, I want to switch uh, gears uh, or in horse racing, what would I say? I want to switch leads to the to the riders, <laughs> and I want to talk about your riders. How do you choose riders? Uh, do you how do you build a connection with them? How do you get to know them? How do you choose them? How does it work for you? You're talking about the jockeys. Jockeys. Yeah. yeah. Yes. Yes. The jockeys. Yeah. yeah. Well, I mean, you know, you know what riders you think are decent riders you know, mm -hmm. and decent horse people. Um, and, um, and then, um, you know, if you establish a rapport with some of those riders, you know, that they spend, you know, enough time with you mm -hmm. um, in the mornings, um, that, uh, like I say, you know, a rapport between a rider and a, a trainer is that, Donnie Seymour and I had a tremendous rapport mm -hmm. um, and uh, we could talk about something afterwards and it made sense mm -hmm. and um, you know whether it was hit, hit more his idea than mine or vice versa but we yeah. both believed in what we what they, we were telling team effort them. team effort so, and Robin Platts was the same way with me yes but um, the um, you know that's that's a very very important thing, and it's and it, it's it's fairly unusual, I think. I mm. believe it is, but uh, and and hard to find. But um, you know, I get the feeling that the morning sessions are usually the most important ones. Because when we spoke to Rocco Bowen, he said, you know, that's where he find the best horses in the mornings. So, I mean, that morning right around, that morning gallop, that morning talking with the trainer, trainer talking with jockey, maybe drinking a coffee, maybe going for a brisk walk, you know, stuff like that. That probably is the real work right there. That's the relationship building probably, I'm assuming. I'm not sure, Sean, you used to be a jockey and you are a trainer. You you, you can actually um, touch on that yourself too. No, I, I like I, I agree with Roger, man. I, I you have to have some kind of rapport, some kind of um, feeling for one another, you know. Because that's the guy you're gonna stand out there, you know, to do to make you millions of dollars, you know. And you have to have a good relationship with whoever writes for you. I, that's my I feel that way also. So who has the who has the? Well, I know who has the final say, but. Well, who makes that decision, jockey or trainer, in in when when to go, when not to go, stuff like that? You ask me. Any one of you can answer. Yeah, anyway, <laughs> yeah. I mean, it's mainly for you. This is your show, you know, <laughs> Mister Atfield. This is your show. This is about you. You're the well, Hall you of know, Famer. You know, you do you do have an owner influence here too. Mm -hmm. That's um, right. Keep forgetting and, uh, about and, that. You know, um, <clears throat> you'll get owners that are adamant that they don't like a certain rider, 
Right. Uh, and uh, if, if that's the case, then that's the way it's going to be. You know, I mean, it's their horse and they're paying the jock. So, um, <clears throat> so if they're really adamant about that, then that that's the way it's going to be. Um, but how do you fix that? Get, how do you work with that? Hmm? How do you work around that? Well, I don't think you can work around it, to be honest with you. I mean, I think, um, you know, you might suggest that you think that um, that they're wrong, but you, you know, mm -hmm. it's that's totally their their decision, really. I mean, um, majority of owners won't get involved in that, but, mm -hmm. but if you have an owner that is adamant about that, then that's the way that's going to be. Mm -hmm. um, and uh, yeah, so I mean, the the, the happiest deal here mm -hmm. is. When you get a, a you know, a, a jockey and, and a trainer that, like I say, have a rapport, can understand each other, have sensible discussions mm -hmm. about something, and one's going to be right and one's going to be wrong, or you both, you know, have some kind of input, and you try to work it out the right way, but um, and the majority of owners will appreciate that that is a working relationship between mm -hmm. you two and, and it's separate to what they think. Yes. But um, uh, it, it, it is a, it's an important factor in the in, you know, respect of um, um, you know, it's many a time that I've said something um, that I was very adamant about at work and you know that i felt that they really messed it up, messed it up and um and a number of times the jock would say you're right i did um and then there's been times where the jock said well i don't think that you needed to work that horse that slow or you needed, didn't need to work that horse that fast i'm not going to argue with them but I'm going to listen to them because, you know, they, they ride the horse. Mm -hmm. um, and, and quite often, you know, situations, you know, I've been in many situations where they've been right and I've been in many situations where I was right. And, uh, but at least you can have that conversation. And nobody can be right all the time, you know. Um, and, and then it's like watching a race and, and, and you know, you have an owner say, well, what the hell was that jock doing? I mean, he got that horse blocked and this, that, the other. But well, maybe they watched that race a little bit differently than I did. But, you know, I didn't think that he had any options, you know, <laughs> or, or there'd be times where I'd say, you're absolutely right. It was a crappy ride. <laughs> so, but, uh, you know, it's the same old thing. He was good as your last winner, right? Well, I'm going to ask you, about Whether you're the, a trainer, uh, jockey, or whatever, it all comes to the bottom <laughs> line is you're as good as your last winner. Yeah. That's right. I want to ask you about the um, the winter campaign, and um, you know, over in over in um, Florida, um, when when I watch racing and I see um, your horses are running in Gulf, at Gulfstream or Tampa Bay or somewhere like that, I always get the feeling like you're just getting ready to come to Woodbine and compete in big races. Is that always the mindset or not really? Well, it depends on what horses you're talking about. You know, the, um, um, in general, I don't like to race too much down here in the winter because we have such a long summer. Um, mm -hmm. Majority of my horses have run through to, you know, to the, into November. So that, that's one of the reasons I like to come to Payson Park because I have a lot of turn eight paddocks, um, a lot of grass, countryside, birds mm -hmm. singing, palm trees, miles of trails. I can take these horses, train them around the trails or lightly or whatever. They get turned out for a couple of hours a day and it just freshens their minds and physically, you know, so, so that I can 
withstand it at the length of the summer. Um, so majority of my horses, that's basically what I do. Um, you know, I try to run the, you know, the odd one I like to t run and see if I can get the owner, you know, a, a bit of money to pay for the flipping winter expenses, which is so expensive. I mean, it's getting worse and worse and worse. I mean, it's huge. Um, but ideally, I like to get my my better horses ready for the Keeneland. Keeneland. Oh, yes, yes. You yes. know, get one race into them at Keeneland, it's only a three week meet anyway. And, um, and then come to Canada May 1st, you know, the first week of May, we start running on the turf usually, um, you know, about the 25th of May. Um, and, um, and then go on from there. So, you know, and now, now of course our calendar's changed tremendously mm -hmm. because now we're not running the plate till September and the Oaks till mm -hmm. August. So it makes a huge difference to, right. You know, if you've got that caliber of a horse, which I don't have too many of those anymore, but the it was before it was essential, basically, to run once at Gulfstream and once at Keeneland before you went up to run in the Oaks, because you'd only get one prep up there, right. you know. And mm -hmm. um, now you've got more time to be, you know, for people and the people that, you know, the majority of people can't afford to go to Florida now anymore. And um, so those horses were at a disadvantage, but now they've got plenty of time to get ready for those races. So, so that that's good, you know. I wonder if, uh, is that going to stay, the, the Queen's Plate um, running so late? Is, is that for good or is that just temporarily? I would say that it's probably going to be for good um, mm -hmm. because I think... That's a big shift. You know, I, it is, and uh, you know, when it first happened, I wasn't really sure I liked it that much. But we were, we were trying to work out how we get racing to even start, and you know, like I mean, it was a mess, right? Um, but now looking at it, um, it might not be a bad idea at all. You know, mm. it gives, like I say, for the for the for the people. They can't afford for their horses to go to Florida. They've still got chance to have their horses for those races, whereas before they would be behind the eight ball, you know. So that's right. Yeah, yeah. A question well, I want to ask you is that coming from Europe, did that did you bring anything from Europe with your style of training horses, or you learned most everything in Canada? Well, I learned all my horsemanship in, in England for sure. Okay. Um, I learned to adapt to racing in North America. I mean, when, when I first came over, my idea of training um, wasn't going to be suitable for the racing here. Um, right. You know, I mean, totally different. Totally different. And uh, how, how different was that? What was the difference? Well, the difference really is the speed. Um, speed and the and the you know the sharp turns of the racetrack um you know i mean if you if you look at the the um especially coming from a steeplechase background you know right. uh, you know we train horses with a lot of stamina and you know you're no. looking at that kind of speed yeah um here in north america um just about every race that's run whether it's a five thousand dollar race or a the stake race first quarter of miles running 22 and change yeah. Yeah. you know right. the last quarter might be 26 28 or whatever whereas back home it'd be totally the opposite way around. yes yes but, um, so there's total difference in the way you train your horses you know and yeah. um, and uh <clears throat> speed speed and you know breaking from the gates so important in north america that, that's I'm interesting sure. I'm not sure. It's interesting Personally, because yeah. mm -hmm. I, I say that's interesting because um, is that one of the main factors why, like, say for the uh, international race and, and races like that, European horses would dominate mostly? Is that is that the reason why? Well, in general, um, you know, they'd love they'd love to see that kind of speed up in front of them because they're, they're trying to, you know, run them down. 
and then finish very quickly, you know, and mm -hmm. we train horses back there behind and cover horses up a lot more than North American jockeys would cover horses up, you know. Um, and uh, yeah, it's a different, different style altogether. And I'm not sure, um, with North American racing, I, th I, I think one of the main reasons of keeping horses sound is very difficult in North America. Um, and basically, I think it's the, the start from the gate is huge. I mean, it's so hard, especially on young horses and that, to break that fast, you know, from a standing start. You know, if you could if you could go back to the olden days and start from the tape like they do the steeplechase horses anyway, <laughs> but I'm talking about you know races used to be run that way, didn't they? Because yeah. um, if you actually see Biscuit had to suddenly go into a gate one day, do you remember that part of the story? But um, I think it was better for the horses, fit, soundness wise. You know, I mean. That break from the gate is so hard on them. It's hard in the back end. It's hard, hard on the back end. Yeah, and 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 then the, you know, and then the, you know, the sharper turns and the yes. speed, speed and the sharper turns, and I, I think it's what causes us to have more soundness problems than we probably should have. I never thought about those things at all. I'm glad you guys were able to, to school me on that because I, I did not think about the gate and the and the rope and the tape and stuff like that. I just That's just figured cool. it's a start. This is just me talking. It's not the, it's not the, it's not the industry talking, okay? <laughs> now you know what no I you know I, I'm kind of smiling to myself really because I'm looking at Roger Atfield and I'm looking at Roger Atfield looking relaxed he's not in a suit i've never seen you without a suit on yeah. <laughs> you, you want to tell me a little bit about the suit and well, always being well dressed <laughs> what were the hat man hat. If, you, if you saw me on my farm up in canada on my tractor and then you saw me down here my shorts and t-shirt building a shed or something you'd see a different side of me but I, i've always Yes, I'm, uh, well, that's kind of the way I was brought up in England, you know, like we dressed to, dressed up to go to the races and, you know, and it's, um, and I, you know, I, you see a lot more of that still in Australia than you do in North America now in the respect that it's, a, it's supposed to be a spectacle, it's supposed to be, mm -hmm. you know, the sport of kings and why I think we should put on a show that looks like we think it's an important thing. You know, I've always said to my people, I don't care if the source is a $5,000 claimer, it's going to go over like it's a million dollar horse, you know, and you're going to go over the same way. And um, I feel quite strongly about that, actually. But I thought that was, that was important, uh, especially that you, that you said, I mean, dressing for the occasion, you know, you, when you get out there, you look like somebody and, you know, and you, you're treated even if your horse is not that good people still give it a shot so um i've, I've always admired that about you uh like i said i've never seen you <laughs> at the track without uh, a suit on and and stuff like that uh so that's great to see and it's really good to see right now see you so relaxed and sipping on the, on the red wine and sharing these, these the Barbadian t-shirt. Yes, <laughs> yes, I love it. Don't, don't forget that. <laughs> yes. Love it. I love it. I love it. I love it. Sean, Sean, um, so what's the what's the, the fever like in Barbados? Um with the horse racing, maybe you can um uh, I don't know, pitch it in there with Roger, maybe he can provide some information that maybe perhaps can even help the industry in Barbados. Uh, stuff like that. Uh, is there, do you have anything there? Well, you're talking about what, like in training and that kind of stuff, Derek? Uh, just the industry in general. No, I mean, Barbados seems to, you know, they have their own way of doing things. Um, you know, I, me back home now, I just try my best to bring some sort of international standards to the, to the island. And 
I can't do that by myself. So, you know, hopefully doing shows like this and having Mr. Atfield and all the other guys that have been on the show so far, it will show people that, you know, there's a big world out there and you got to bring the standards up, you know. But I can't do it by myself. Well, uh, I mean, you're, you're absolutely right about that. Um, I mean, you're, you're right about that. It's still an industry and it's still... Uh, a yeah. club and and it's so forth and that's 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 a can of worms i i imagine yeah but i like that the fact is that to our show you know we have two barbadians you're in canada i'm here i'm speaking to international trainers administration mr bannon who was in um you know he broadcasting everything like that so you know the more i do that or we do that you know we hopefully we see let people know that barbadian guys are doing this and hopefully, you know, the industry will follow the same pace. Hopefully, I guess take, I guess taking the uh, the other uh, writers as serious as well too. But I guess it goes both ways. So because they they gotta play their part too. Now I want to get back to Roger, um, mm -hmm. and I want to talk about his stress stress level, especially um, you know, like start of the year. You got uh, Queen Split hopeful. You got. Kentucky Derby hopeful sometimes uh, and you know how much stress is that on a person like yourself and and do you still get amped up for the seasons yeah um, well to be honest with you I don't uh, I don't stress very much to be quite honest with you and I don't uh, I can see that <laughs> I don't um, the the um, you know, as time goes by, you know, I probably did more years ago, but not a whole lot more actually, but probably did more years ago than I do now. But, um, and uh, where I am sitting right at this particular point of time, I, I don't have too much to stress about. I've got a couple of older horses, they're pretty nice horses, that mapping out their career is, is very concerning to me right now that I do the right thing by them because they're both very valuable horses. You know, one can definitely go to stud and one one's very valuable filly. Um, so the decisions on those are very important. Um, as far as Queen's Plate this year is concerned, I don't have to worry about that because I don't have a three-year-old colt. So but um, but that wouldn't really concern me to be uh, at all, to be honest with you. It'd just be a question of, like I say, keeping the horse healthy, happy, and, mm -hmm. and, and hoping that the right races come up and go for them to make the program work. But, you know, with the Queen's Plate this year being in September, like I say, you, there's, there's no panic about exactly how you go about it. So, um, but, you know, like, uh, yeah, I mean, the, the, the two horses that I have that are worthwhile, you know, really talking about, um, mapping out their careers is, is important. And, uh, you know, I, I put a lot of thought into it, um, but I don't stress about it, you know, honestly. Really. Is there, is there um, a track preference for you uh, or actually a surface type do you prefer one over the other uh turf synthetic sand what's your preference well my preference always been turf um mm -hmm. you know if i had to take it by the three i'd go turf um all weather and then dirt i've never been a real keen person on dirt um i think uh, I, i've looked at my my uh, records for quite a few years back and i know that i heard a lot more horses on the dirt than i have done on the all weather and the turf but you can get hurt on anything we were talking about his vest here that was a good turf course that day there was no you know you can't blame blame the track for that um but um i like the all weather um is it ideal? No, probably nothing's ideal, except you know, ideal weather situations. But um, uh, with the with the all weather, it's much much easier to train a horse 
you know, like I mean, if I, you know, I plant, I'm, I'm working at a number of horses tomorrow at Payson Park, um, it, because the forecast is good. Um, but if the forecast wasn't good and we got a lot of rain tonight and that track mm -hmm. got greasy and slippery, I'd have yes. to cancel those works. That's right. Um, now, with the ones that I'm working tomorrow, it wouldn't really matter. Mm -hmm. But if I was coming up for a big race, and that was the day I wanted to work because I was like six race, six days out from that race. I know exactly what I'm, what I'm trying to do here. And I got to cancel and then it's worse the next day. Mm -hmm. now, I'm, now, I'm, now I'm in a pickle, you know, yes. what I should do or shouldn't do. Um, with the all weather, I can stay with my program and um, I find it very much easier. Perfect. I'd like to ask you one question before, because I mean, we've talked a little while now. But I spent some time with Laurie Severe in 2018, and in sitting down talking with him, I was sitting, I remember he was sitting on his little bench, and I was sitting on a bale of hay. And he said, Sean, I will never retire. You have to take me out of this place feet first. What is your position? Are you, are you going to soldier on for the next 10 years? What's, tell us. Well, I'm going to uh, I continue training racehorses all the time that I'm happy doing it, and, mm -hmm. I, and, I, and, and that I feel that I'm doing a good job. Right. If I feel that I'm not doing a good job, and um, and and start you know not really wanting to actually go and do it, then I'm out of there, you know. Otherwise, they will take me when I fall off my perch. Do you still it. get on your pony? I, well, I say I do, I do and I don't. I do, yes. Um, I had an incident uh, about um, a month ago where I got COVID, um, fully vaccinated and what have you. Yes. So I, w I wasn't really, really sick, but I, uh, I have an e equilibrium problem where I had these ear surgeries years ago mm -hmm. all the time anyway. Um, that accentuated that and I was very weak and very very dizzy and what have you, so I stopped riding the pony. Okay. And uh, but I kept on working and doing stuff, and then I had this terrible cough continuing, and um, so my friends decided that I definitely had to go and see somebody because I'm very obstinate about that. And I went, and they said you've got pneumonia, so <laughs> so I slowed up a little bit. And I haven't been getting on the pony, but I did actually. It's funny you should say that, but I intend to get on him again next week. Wow. Yeah, I mean, I, 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 I figure once you're still riding, you can still continue. <laughs> yeah, that would be okay. Yeah. <laughs> uh, last last week when we spoke with Jim Bannon, uh, I asked Jim, Jim Bannon if he wasn't um, involved in horse racing, what else would he be doing? And he said, fishing. He'll be down there in Barbados fishing with John O'Jones. And I wonder about you. If you were not involved in horse racing, what else would you be doing? Yeah, probably the same thing. Um, you know, I have two. Um, I don't do as much fishing by any manner of means as I'd like to, um, which I should. Um, I'm very involved in um, in. in landscaping and building stuff and what have you. I just finished work, uh, put, uh, building a 24 foot by 12 foot workshop so that I can do more woodworking in there. And and um, I enjoy doing that probably more than anything else. Um, and I get so so involved with that. And by the time I finish training and I do that, I don't have time to go fishing, but I could make time. You know, it's my fault. But I, I love fishing and um, so yeah, you never see. You know, might see me down in Barbados on the Legacy every day. Never know. <laughs> Donald might give me a job. <laughs> I sure you <he> would. <laughs> he he probably wouldn't pay enough. <laughs> I, I get a feeling that every, every day is a party with John O. <laughs> is it like say like that, Sean? <laughs> John O. and. When you go fishing with John, I've been out a couple of times and you know it's, it's a lot of fun, you know. John, as you know, he doesn't say much, but 
put the right brew in his hand. Yes, he will even talk a bit. <laughs> <laughs> very good, very good fisherman, John. That's for sure. Oh yeah. I love I love fishing myself too. By the way, uh, I really enjoy fishing. Um, it's one of the things that I really love to do uh, during the summers, and when I get a chance to go to Barbados, I like doing it too. But um, I don't know what it is. It's just peaceful for me, and you know, just takes me away. But <laughs> I love it. <laughs> well, all, all, all my Barbadian boys down here that work for me, they can't wait to get out at noon, and they're they're gone fishing. Oh, wow. And what's the name? Um, um, Nicholas. Nicholas. Yeah. Uh, he might be on the beach right now. Yeah. I, he posts <laughs> pictures all the time. He sent me all these fish. Yeah. Dave Griffith, I think, is working for you also. And you guys, you guys fishing every day. I know. I have. It's amazing. Yeah. yeah. Now, I want to ask before, before we yeah, jump good, off. Yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah really. Before we jump, do you keep the same? Uh, is it the? Do you have a different um, set of guys working for you when you flip over to the to to to, uh, to Florida, or is it the same crew from in Canada? Well, this year I only bought seventeen horses down here, um, so all my help outside of a couple of hot walkers, um, they're all Canadian that mm. work for me in Toronto. Oh, um, cool. And um, and I would take as many as them back to Keeneland as I uh, can. But uh, Nicholas, he works the gate, so um, yes. he uh, he has to be back by May first or something like that. So he won't be out. And I haven't asked the others what their intentions are right now. But you know, they've got a job with me as long as they want one. So well, um, I don't have uh, much more I can talk about ants right now with you mr atfield and if you want to do that let's do that but i in terms of your accomplishments there's not much i can touch on with your accomplishments i mean they're they're so wide and massive i mean i i looked up the stakes races that you won there's so many eight queens plate uh two halls of fames in one in canada one in the <laughs> united states of america like like for me, I got, I, I just looked at it. And I was like, how do, how do you do that? How do you feel afterwards? Where do you go from here? Like, what's your drive? Like, does anyone ever tap you on the shoulder and say, Roger, you can relax now? <laughs> do you ever get that? <laughs> yeah. Well, probably a lot of people pat me on the shoulder and say, you better go away. <laughs> 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 no, it's um, yeah. I mean, you know, I've been very fortunate for sure, and uh, and like I say, as long as I'm healthy, happy, and uh, enjoy, I'm still doing what I do. It's, uh, it's I take it to the to the extreme, you know, but uh, it's got to be that way. You've got to be happy doing it. So that's right. That's a beautiful story, you know. Wonderful. Um, well, um, he has to get up early tomorrow, so I don't think we should keep him much longer. Well, um, so if we keep him up, he's going to keep drinking more red wine, and I'm going to keep <laughs> sipping my water. So we're going to have that a good night. That won't be good for the morning. <laughs> well, this water won't be good for my bladder. I mean, every three hours, I'll be probably up in the washroom. <laughs> You're just you're just showing off now, talking about drinking water. I don't know. Yeah. <laughs> you sure that's not vodka? <laughs> yeah, exactly. <Or> <laughs> Let's call it water. <laughs> mm -hmm. Listen, um, so I, I want to thank you uh, again for for joining us on this this um, this episode. Um, it was absolute pleasure um for me is like looking back at guys like you seeing where you started from you know you had dreams of riding in steeple chases and stuff like that and then you just hop countries <laughs> and, and, and shift gears you know and, and that's like sean said this this um show is about journeys and it took a divorce uh for you to switch gears um 
you know, it, there's all that stuff that a lot of people don't always get to hear, um, you know, and, and look what has happened is uh, propelled you into the kind of person that you are today. And um, with, with tremendous accomplishments, um, some things that people probably can't even dream of, of um, accomplishing uh, to what you have done. So again, I want to thank you, man, for spending this time with us and uh, I'm blessing the show actually, and um, sharing some insight and um, hopefully it inspires uh, young trainers and, and businessmen to, to do the same thing too. Well, thank you very much. It's been a pleasure talking with you. Thank Sean? You so much for you, man. Really appreciate it, man. It's just, this is this is like heaven for me. <laughs> okay. Heaven. Uh, heaven. Thank I you. I consider so myself, you know, I, I don't get a chance to really sit to talk to great men like yourself who is in the same field as me. And I really appreciate what you've done tonight. And um, I wish you all the best going forward in the future. I hope you have a great season at Woodbine um, this year. And We'll be looking up for you. Thank you so much. It's been a pleasure, guys, and uh, and look, stay well and stay healthy. Thank you. You, you do the care. same. Do the same. Thank you so much. God bless. Take care. All right. Bye bye. Thank you. Wow. wow. That was a great show. So uh, much and um, things that I I sure a lot of people didn't know. Now they know if they watch this show tonight. Great stuff, brother. Well, you know, um, you know, just hearing the stories, and for me, the man went through a little bit of hiccup early in life, and he decided, look, I'm gonna make some changes. Yeah. And um, you know, I think that sometimes people don't always see, you know, what a person goes through to where yes. they arrive yeah. at. You know, and it's, it's always good to hear from some some of the top people, um, their journeys and, and how they have arrived, you know, and uh, it makes all of us uh, want to dream and give us the same kind of uh, drive to uh, do the same thing or even better. I mean, I for you. Tell all these youngsters in this in Barbados, that there's a big world out there waiting to be discovered. You know what I mean? And that's a perfect example, you know, because you could get him then to a place like this where you feel like you're going nowhere. But the opportunities outside of this country sometimes are tremendous. And Rajat Fielders told us that tonight, you know. And a lot of Barbadians have gone that route too. Not as successful, but you make a living, you get some dollars, and you could do it for a very long time. I mean, he's what? He's 83 years old now and still a puppet again. Can't ask for more than that. Isn't that something? No, at 83 years old and still rise and still yeah. still out there early in the morning he's still yeah. you know still getting involved uh, still drinking a, a, a glass of red wine yeah. you know <laughs> yeah. cool i mean that was the coolest thing man i, I think that was the coolest thing i saw just sipping and chatting <laughs> i you know I, I the thing about this is that this is a man who is a hall of famer in the United States and in Canada, he's won eight Queen's Plate. Yes. Right? Uh, I mean, it, it doesn't it give you a sense of um, assurance that you can at least not, I'm not saying you can do the same thing, but you can try to do even better or some some of the things, you know? You can achieve, man. And what, once you're, and you no, know, a lot of it has to do with opportunities too. and. But the beauty about North America in those places, you can make your own opportunities. I mean, there's a place where you can buy your own little cheap horse and start from there if you don't have owners. But you can buy a cheap horse that make you look good. And then people will notice your ability. And as he came to, to Canada, not really a tourbred horseman. And look at him now, you know, it just shows you. And one thing that's... The one thing that stood out to me was was uh, you know when I asked him about the uh, the his attire how he dressed mm -hmm. and um, he said well you know he dressed that way um, but when he took his horses you know out he wanted people to make them wanted people to to see and and make them feel like the horse was was like 
a million okay. dollar horse, yeah. even though yeah. it was maybe an eight eight thousand mm -hmm. dollar horse too. So, so I guess it's but part of the game. For myself, um, the in, investors when he got injured because I knew when the horse got hurt, um, that that rocked race track man. I mean, people were shell shocked for a long time, you know, because there's a triple crown winner. Then just say like that he's gone, and I, I just. It was good to hear how I could see it still hurts him talking yeah, about it. Still him. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I see that. Sorry it went there, but um we gotta find we gotta know these things, man. Right? These things we gotta know. Yes, yes, absolutely. Well, um it's been another week, uh, another episode. Um again, um uh, it's been uh, surprisingly um how the show has turned out where you know we People are asking us so many questions. Uh, people are, are giving us suggestions, uh, ideas, you know. And again, I want to thank everyone for for viewing and everyone for for tuning in. Uh, I mean, you don't. I mean, it's, it's always going to be on the internet, so you can always go back and watch it over. If you missed something, you can yes. obviously go back and see where you missed. Uh, maybe perhaps you can grab some little nuggets from from uh, great men like like. Like Mr. Roger Atfield and Jim Bannon and great writers like Rocco, um, and he's still pretty young. You know, he's yeah. he's only like 32 or something. 31. Uh, 31. Yeah. And so I mean, like, like the, the show is always Steve, Steve Lim, man. Steve Lim, great administrator. Right. Can't forget Steve. <laughs> All right, well, I can't forget about him. He had me cracking up so much on the show, and also. Yeah. Uh, his, his words of inspiration meant yes. a lot to a lot of people. I mean, yes. he came on like it was like a storm. So he came yeah. to me, he came on very quietly, and all of a sudden, this this rush of excitement from all these people wanted to know more and say, "Look, that was a great story." Yes. You know, yes. calling you all the time, people messaging me. Uh, yes. uh, that was that was beautiful, man. Really yes. beautiful. And I can't wait for next week uh, when yes. we bring somebody else on and yes. we same thing tune in people that's right so uh on that note um on that note uh is there anything else you want to share or anything else you want to say yeah, that's it man we have a great show i, I thank roger Atfield for coming on tonight um he just give filled us filled us, just fill the room up with a lot of information man and that's what this the show is about we, we we come here to inform the people about many different things and many different areas of the business and hopefully um you know people watch and learn and and you know don't be shy to to do some of the things that they hear from this show that's right that's right well um i guess that's it be out i mean i'm, I'm